All right. Um, so I think we can get started. Um, so I'm Kevin. Um, I'm teaching the class, obviously. Um, Priya Dashan is our TA for the semester. I think a lot of you probably already know Priya, uh, a lot of familiar faces here. Um, so I think today what we're going to do is just kind of introduce the class, right? Distributed Energy Resources, or DERs. What, what are they? Uh, why are they worth studying? Um, what might be the flavor of the class? Things like that. Um, and then, uh, hey, no worries, come on in. <laughs> and then we'll go over class policies and, and uh, how to participate online for folks in the online section and, and things like that. Hey. Okay, um, so before we get started, um, let's see, I just wanna do a little demographic survey here. So um, first of all, how many people are undergraduates? Okay, two of you. So were you, as an undergrad, were you able to just enroll without any special permissions or? They've done in the four by one program. Oh, okay, so you're sort of a master's-ish, okay. Um, and we'll talk offline about how to get you in, I think. Um, and then how many people are, are master's students? Okay, so about 10. And for folks online, there are maybe 25-ish people in the room. And then how many are, are PhD? Okay, so another 10-ish, something like that. Um, okay, so just so folks know, there is both an in-person and an online section of this class. Um, and I think if you can't enroll technically in the in-person section, you might be able to enroll in the online section. That might be a little bit of a, a backdoor there. Um, but for the online folks, so you are welcome to, to participate like you're participating today uh, by joining on Zoom. But if you want to, like if you can't join concurrently, um, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, so you can join, or sorry, rather, you can just watch the lecture videos, which I'll post online. Um, and I'll tell you where to find those and stuff like that. Um, I think the only really concurrent requirement that we'll have is um, there'll be a final project component of the class. And we'll ask you, um, the online folks, to actually um, join a Zoom meeting uh, in real time for that to do the final presentations. But, um, okay, and then on demographics, so let's see, in terms of, oh, by the way, the online folks, I believe, are all master's students, and there's about five online right now, but we have, I think, about 10 of them total enrolled. Um, so in terms of majors and fields then, so how many people are in mechanical? Most of the room, and no surprise, this is kind of sneakily listed as an ME class. I don't think it's listed in any other departments yet, but uh, anybody in electrical? Okay, one double E. And then um, how about civil? Okay, and anything else? What, uh, computer science, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, Alex checks, checks, a, uh, checks a few boxes here. Um, okay, and folks online, um, please feel free. So I don't have like any visual cues if you have questions and stuff. Um, so, so please just speak up if you do. Um, and folks in the room as well, um, you know, if you have questions, comments, et cetera, please just raise a hand or even just uh, speak out if you want to. So I'd like the, this to be kind of informal and, and conversational. Okay, um, so with that being said, let me jump in here. Um, so again, today we're going to basically introduce the class. Um, what are DERs? Why might we be interested in studying them? And then we'll talk about kind of the format um, and, uh, and the policies for the class. So... Um, DERs, or Distributed Energy Resources, or some people just pronounce the acronym DERS. <laughs> so, so DERS basically, at least in my view, are electrical devices that plug in uh, at the edge of the power grid rather than sort of centrally, right? That's the distributed portion. Um, and they uh, can be controlled, um, typically over the internet or, or some other um, remote communication channel. Um, so that's really the, the resource portion of it, is the idea that that controllability allows um, people in the power grid to use uh, these resources um, you know, to provide reliability services or reduce emissions, reduce costs, and, and things like that. Um, so I like this poster here. This is made by the Loan Programs Office and the, the, the Department of Energy, but it has kind of a nice sketch of a lot of the things that we'll be studying. Um, so you can see on this garage roof here, there are solar panels. Um, you can see uh, that we've got an electric vehicle plugged in, in the garage. Um, these things here are batteries kind of hung on the wall. Uh, this front and center here is an electric heat pump, um, basically uh, an electric and efficient electric machine that provides heating uh, and cooling. And then uh, also things like washing machines and, and uh, dryers and refrigerators, stuff like that. Um, appliances, oftentimes their operation can be kind of scheduled and coordinated in a, in a smart fashion. 
Um, so those count too. And various other things in theory could be counted as, as uh, DERs, but this is basically the, the stuff that we'll study in this class. So um, all the devices that we'll talk about are electrical. That means they all plug in to the power grid at some scale. Um, and here's just a, a quick illustration of what that looks like. Again, to drive home the, the D in DERs, the distributed fashion. Um, so basically uh, going from left to right here on the left-hand side, this is the, um, the transmission grid. Um, so here we have big power uh, generators, things like nuclear power plants, coal and natural gas fired power plants. Um, they generate electricity, typically they're rotating machines, and they tie in um, to the blue part here, which is the electricity transmission grid. Uh, they tie in basically through a transformer that steps up the voltage um, from whatever the generator uh, produces at up to typically in the order of hundreds of kilovolts. And uh, you know, um, resistive losses on electric power lines, um, on conductors basically are sort of I squared R losses. Um, so the higher the voltage you can transmit power at, uh, the lower the current that flows basically. And so then you get a big reduction in those energy uh, losses due to resistance in, in the wires. And so that's why typically over long distances, we transmit at high voltages um, in this kind of blue section here. And then um, out at the edge of the power grid, typically we'll have um, a step down transformer that, that drops the voltage down to order of 10 kilovolts. And then uh, this will be the, the distribution network is what, what's uh, sketched in green here. And so these are the poles and the wires that you see um, when you kind of walk around West Lafayette or, or whatever town you happen to be in. Uh, in big cities, sometimes these things are underground, uh, but often they're, they're overhead. And then on the poles, typically we'll be mounted um, a little transformer and that will step down the voltage from the sort of order of 10 kilovolt distribution voltage to whatever people use within buildings. Um, so the outlets in this building, for example, are, are typically either 120 or 240 volts, um, but there may be larger customers, things like factories and, and uh, you know, warehouses and things like that, where they might have uh, larger sort of high, higher voltages on the order of 10 to maybe 50 or 60 uh, kilovolts. So, um, so if we drew the entire power grid, we would have a number of these generators, but not, not too many, maybe on the order of hundreds of these. We would have many, many miles of these transmission lines, and then there would be a bunch of these clusters, these things on the right-hand side that are really the distributed nodes that plug into the power grid. And we might have thousands of, of those that include millions or hundreds of millions of customers in the US. And so the, the place the DERs plug in really is at the outer, the periphery of the grid, kind of this green portion. Um, so solar photovoltaics are one of the DERs that we'll study uh, in depth. And uh, I think, no surprise, everyone kind of knows what, what these things look like. Um, but if you want to be able to predict how they work, how much energy is going to come off of a solar array on a given day or over the course of a given month or a year, uh, it turns out that there's some non-trivial math and, and coding that, that needs to be done for that. Um, so that the output of a solar panel is going to vary, obviously, based on the time of day, right? If it's dark out, you get no power off. At noon, you get a lot. Um, but also based on the, the orientation and the tilt of the panel. Um, so a panel that's facing west may produce uh, power in the afternoon when the sun is in that direction. A, power, a panel that faces uh, due south in the northern hemisphere will, will peak around noon. Uh, and then they vary based on the season as well. Um, so this is an array that someone has in, in Utah. And uh, it's on a very steep roof. So it's tilted, you know, maybe sort of uh, about 60 degrees from the horizontal. And so uh, with that tilt, they actually maximize the power output in, in winter. And so you see the highest peak on a, on a clear day and the, the blue uh, in winter here. And then in summer, the peak is lower, but the, the sort of bell curve is, is wider. And so the overall energy production from the solar panel might be larger. And then in, in spring and fall, it's sort of somewhere in between. And then the nature of uh, a solar panel's power output also depends a lot on what's happening in the atmosphere and in particular with clouds. Um, so this is a clear day here, um, this April 16th day. And then a fully overcast day, the April 21st day, um, is very cloudy, and so you get minimal power output. And then we get this crazy sort of really wiggly and jagged, um, you know, sort of really random looking uh, power output on a, on a partly cloudy day. And this is basically clouds blowing over the panels that's causing all that sort of noise in the, in the signal here. So as we go along through the semester, we'll learn how to, you know, what, what's the math that basically underlies these calculations, where to get weather data that you can pipe basically into, into code that will predict things like this power output. Um, why are solar, solar panels of interest? Um, this is a little bit of a busy plot, um, but it shows in, in each of the subplots here, it shows the years 2010 through 2020. And on the vertical axis is the cost per watt of installed capacity of solar. 
Um, so if you install, say, uh, in, in 2010, a, a one kilowatt array, that would be 1,000 watts. And so we'd be at somewhere around um, $8,000 to, to produce that or to install that on, on a house. And this is showing really the exponential cost decline curve that solar panels uh, have been on over the last decade. And that's uh, largely due to improvements in, in manufacturing that have really driven down the cost of the solar uh, cells that make up the panel. So you can see uh, one interesting trend here is in all of these. So we have residential, um, basically rooftops and, and uh, homes and things like that on the upper left. Uh, commercial, so this is office buildings and warehouses and stuff. Um, but again, on rooftops, this is in the upper right. And then utility scale, so this would be like a, a big field of solar panels. So you know, if you drive from here to the Indianapolis airport, uh, as you get close to the airport, you pass a big solar farm. So that's kind of the utility scale that we're looking at here. And uh, fixed tilt means that those things are just kind of you know welded or bolted in place. Um, and on the bottom right here, we have one axis tracking, which means that uh, during the day um, on one dimension, the panels will actually tilt and swivel to sort of track the sun. So you can see that in all these plots, there's a, sort of an exponential cost to K curve that's been happening, making solar basically increasingly affordable. Um, but you can also see differences in, in basically the residential scale is the most expensive, and then commercial rooftops is somewhat less expensive, and utility scale with no tracking is the cheapest. Uh, and actually with a little bit of tracking, it's only, only slightly more expensive, maybe kind of on the order of 5%, something like that cost difference. Um, so anyway, the point here is that, you know, where we install these things, whether they're kind of central and huge farms or on rooftops kind of out at the edge of the grid matters. Um, but really, whatever you look at, the, these things are on a, a really uh, impressive cost dec decay curve that really has been driven by um, federal investment in the U.S. and, and also government invest investment in many other uh, countries and by the hard work and, and uh, you know, smart researchers and, and uh, engineers like yourselves. Uh, another DER we'll study is, is batteries. Um, and you know, so this is basically electrochemical energy storage. You use electricity to drive a chemical reaction uh, that basically stores chemical potential energy. And then uh, to get power back out, you run that reaction in reverse and, and generate electricity. And just like solar, the cost of batteries has been on this kind of exponential decay curve. So here we're looking again at 10 years, but it's running 2013 to 2023. Uh, and I, I just pulled this a, a week or two ago. Um, so again, this is the installed cost of basically the batteries themselves. It does not include the labor and, and the, you know, sort of overall the, the wiring and, and things like that that might be done to put this into a, a garage, for example. But the basic point here is that batteries, again, have been on this really sharp uh, cost decline. And again, that's driven by federal investment. It's driven by advances at the scientific and kind of R&D scale. It's driven by manufacturing, build out, and economies of scale um, as uh, more and more people have produced more and more of these things. We'll also talk about electric vehicles, which are basically, for our purposes, just batteries that can drive around. Um, <laughs> so uh, this plot here is showing um, the, the base, the sort of black curve here, is um, the electricity consumption profile from uh, a couple of hundred houses in, uh, in upstate New York on a, on a random, I think, spring day. And uh, the time axis is running from 3 p.m. to the next uh, afternoon. So this is one day. Um, and the middle here is, is 3 in the morning. So you can see kind of when uh, power consumption peaks in a typical neighborhood uh, is actually around 8 p.m. When people come home, they're cooking, you know, lights are on, uh, taking showers, things like that. And then all the red on top of this is a bunch of data from a bunch of different days uh, of charging about 100 electric vehicles that plug in um, to these homes. So you can see a few things that um, they, uh, obviously the energy used by the electric vehicles adds a bunch of, of energy uh, of area under this electric power curve, but also it actually uh, coincides pretty, uh, pretty nicely or pretty badly, depending on your point of view, with the, uh, the peak that was already there from kind of the uh, other power that people were using. So we drive the peak from about 120 kW up to about 170 kW by adding EVs. So um, you can imagine that there might be better ways to coordinate the charging of these vehicles so that rather than you know, people coming home, plugging in their cars, and then having the cars charge full blast at the same time that people are you know, already using a bunch of electricity for other purposes, you might wait a little while and, and kind of fill the, the valley in this electric power. And so we'll talk about in this class ways that you could promote that, uh, you know, either through direct control or through kind of economic you know, pricing type mechanisms. Um, we'll also talk about heat pumps uh, and air conditioners. Um, so how many people in research or classes have, have talked about heat pumps before? 
Okay. There's a lot of people here from our laboratory, which is Herrick Labs and mechanical engineering. It's about half the class and about half of the research that's uh, going on in Herrick right now is, is on heat pumps. So it's a much loved topic for many of us. But um, it's okay if you've never heard of this before, we'll introduce these things kind of from a basic level. Um, but a heat pump, you know, it's basically, you can think of it in a couple ways. One is it's basically an air conditioner that runs in reverse. Um, so an air conditioner takes heat from a cooler place, you know, indoors during the summer and moves it outside. So if you walk around the outdoor unit of an of a air conditioner when it's running in the middle of the summer and you put your hands uh, near it, not in it, obviously don't hurt yourself, but you'll feel hot air um, coming off of, of there. And that's basically heat that's being moved from inside uh, to outside. So here are a couple of sketches. This is what's called a mini split heat pump. Um, you know, these are really technologies that have taken off a lot in the last maybe 10 years. You don't see too many of them here. We, we more see what are called unitary split systems, um, basically a, a block, you know, of, of a machine outside and another block inside. Um, but these, you know, are, are uh, increasingly popular. And this is a window uh, heat pump, um, which actually, it's just like a window air conditioner. You stick it in your house and it uh, makes a room warm in the winter or, or cool in the summer. So, um, so these are maybe not a, a huge part of the electricity system today, but increasingly as we decarbonize uh, space heating, um, heat pumps will play an increasingly prominent role. Um, so we'll talk about what they might do to the grid and, and how you could coordinate them in order to mitigate um, those impacts. And then we'll talk about thermal storage. Um, this is a very simple kind of thermal storage. On the left here, it's basically what, what people call box of rocks heat storage. Um, so these are, are resistance heating elements. And then these are basically bricks. So the heating elements get hot, they warm up the bricks, and then the bricks are inside this insulated box here. So the white stuff here is insulation. And uh, so you can imagine if electricity is really abundant or really cheap at a certain time, you might use it to store a bunch of heat in this box. And then um, you know, when electricity gets expensive, rather than running a heat pump directly from the grid, you could um, blow use a fan basically to blow air over um, these bricks and, and provide heating to a room uh, in that way. Uh, yep, question? How big is that? How big is this thing? Um, so there are varying sizes. I, I tried to make this roughly to scale. I think that's why it looks a little bit small here, but it might be you know, about, so this thing uh, is a heat pump water heater and this might be about seven or eight feet tall. Um, so this thing is probably maybe three or four feet tall, something like that. Um, there are centralized versions of this, which would go in a basement and they might be much bigger. Um, so you know, it kind of depends on the application. Um, yeah, I, I included the bike in here for scale for the, the water heater. <laughs> So, um, so a water heater typically, you know, they can be fired by natural gas and we're not really interested in those because we're thinking about electric stuff in this class. Um, they can be powered by electric resistance, basically running current through big hunks of metal um, to make the metal hot. Um, or they can be run by, by heat pumps. And I know that that's kind of many, maybe meaningless term for about half of you right now, but basically they run um, basically similar uh, machines to refrigerators and air conditioners just kind of backwards. And they uh, basically soak heat out of the ambient air uh, surrounding this thing and move it into the water uh, inside the tank. And in that way, they can be you know, two or three times more efficient than using electric resistance. Um, we may talk about some other devices. We may spend a little bit of time talking about the physics and, and the operation of the power grid, but that's kind of the core um, content. And, uh, and actually, it turns out that a lot of that stuff can be studied with very similar uh, mathematical models. So we'll learn a couple of mathematical modeling and simulation techniques and be able to apply it broadly to a, a, an interesting array of devices. OK, so that's kind of what DERs are, um, but let's talk about why we might want to study them. Um, so for a number of reasons, uh, we need basically to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, quickly and at huge scales. Um, and DERs are a key uh, tool, basically, or an array of tools for doing that decarbonization effort. And uh, so maybe that's interesting for you already. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe you're more interested in getting a, a good job, doing something interesting and a cool new business. Well, if that's the case, um, also adoption of these DERs is already taking off. And there's a lot of innovation on the business side and the engineering side in these technologies. And then the kind of stuff we'll learn about, basically tools to, to model, to understand, and then to design and, and control DERs, uh, these tools can really enhance the value that DERs provide to people. Um, so they can, first of all, improve the user experience, right? Um, so keep your house more comfortable, um, you know, keep your hot water uh, hot, even when you have a bunch of guests over taking showers, something like that. Um, keep your house powered, uh, even during a power outage. Um, you know, keep your electric vehicle charge, you know, so you have just enough energy, whatever you want at the time that you want it and things like that. 
um, that can basically improve the efficiency of these machines as well, um, or operate them at times when uh, maybe electricity is cleaner, something like that. And in this way, we can um, uh, basically increase the emission reductions that we get uh, from deploying DERs. And then they can uh, reduce the costs, make things more affordable to, to more people, and, uh, and they can unlock participation in um, power grid operations, um, basically promoting more, more resilient and reliable power grid, um, which also can unlock um, new revenue streams for, for businesses and, uh, and improve the value proposition overall. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these points kind of and just expanding on these bullet points a little bit more in a few slides here. Um, okay, so why must we reduce greenhouse gas emissions quickly? Well, um, humans have already changed the climate, right? So when I was in your shoes and in grad school, we were talking about, oh, climate change is a future thing, right? And now we can point to things that are already happening um, that, you know, with real people really suffering from its impacts. Um, so this is a chart here of um, going back to 1980. So this is, I guess, roughly my lifetime here. Um, and, uh, and on the y-axis um, is two y-axes and the bars correspond to the left axis here. And it might be a little small, but this says number of events. Um, so this is the number of natural disasters, weather or climate driven disasters that have cost at least $1 billion uh, in, in sort of 2020 dollars um, over the last roughly 40 years. And then the other axis, this is the, the curves correspond to the other axis and it's the cost in billions of dollars. And so the, the top of the Y axis here is about $450 billion. So you can see the basic trend here is that, you know, back in the 80s and the 90s, there weren't that many huge catastrophes happening in the United States. But in the last you know, 10 to 15 years, we've really seen this uh, increasing growth in, in really bad uh, weather events that have had really serious repercussions. Um, so this is a big deal. You know, uh, $450 billion a year in, in disasters is, is not small. That's essentially um, as much money as all Americans spend on all energy used in homes and businesses. Um, it's about on the order of, I guess, half of the U.S. military budget, which is about a trillion dollars per year. So this is not a small amount of money in, in damages just in, in the U.S. that's being incurred. Now, of course, not all of this is due to climate change. We would still have hurricanes and things like that if we hadn't changed the climate. But these things are being, uh, they're, they're more frequent and more intense and more severe, basically, because of uh, what humans have done uh, to basically store more energy in, in the climate. Um, okay, so this is happening. It's happening in the U.S. It's having real consequences. Thousands of people have died uh, from, from events like this in, the, in, in recent years. Um, but the U.S., of course, is relatively well off globally. We have a lot of resources for, for dealing with and mitigating disasters like this. And uh, in places, you know, um, denser populations living closer to the sea with people who are more poor uh, than, than Americans, uh, their, the ability to cope with the impacts of things like this is, of course, uh, much more severe or much worse. So, um, so already we're seeing this happening even in rich, rich nations and the future for poor nations um, is, is increasingly bleak if we don't act quickly. Okay, so how do we act quickly? Um, so the International Energy Agency, this is a sort of nonpartisan uh, international group of, of many of the, the major economies and, and, and countries in the world. Um, they publish what they call the net zero roadmap. So the idea is how do we get cumulative greenhouse gas emissions um, down basically to zero? Or, or if we can't get them down to zero, then, then how do we keep emitting, but also offset those emissions by doing things like planting lots of trees and, and slowing deforestation and storing carbon underground and, and so forth. So the IEA, in a recent report that came out um, last year, 2023, um, they said, uh, quote, by 2035, emissions need to decline by 80% in advanced economies and 60% in emerging market and developing economies compared to the 22 level, 2022 level. Um, so 80% from last year's level by 2035. So that is not a, not a small task. But I think it is achievable. Um, and by the way, um, so the difference basically between advanced economies and, and emerging mar market economies is more or less boils down to, to GDP. Um, so US certainly is in the, the 80% um, reduction uh, here. Okay, so what does that look like? So, so this is um, on the y-axis, all uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States in units of megatons or millions of metric tons um, of CO2 equivalent. So what that equivalent means is it's not just carbon dioxide, but also other gases that contribute to, to global heating. Um, so things like methane and uh, particulates and aerosols and, and other stuff. So again, this is going back to 1990. 
And, uh, and you can see the black line here more or less peaks in about 2005 uh, for the US. And since then, total greenhouse gas emissions have been declining at an average rate. And that's basically the slope of the dashed line here of about negative 70 megatons per year. And if we look at what is needed, so this uh, y, uh, x axis ends at 2035. If we look at what's needed to achieve that 80% reduction, basically that puts us on this blue pathway. So we need to uh, basically accelerate by a factor of five, right? So 500% faster emission reductions than we've been doing. Yes? Is there something specific that happened in 2005? So what happened in 2005? Does anybody want to take a guess? Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005. Yeah, that's probably not what caused greenhouse gas emissions. And for a little while, that certainly had a, had a big impact. But um, it, what was that? Well, I was saying, like, big, when you have, like, a big city like New Orleans, that's shut down. They have to go a lot of, a, a, a lot of generators, but, but that's not going to amount to, like, a bunch of, like, huge heat. You know, so it's, it's true. It's true. I think if we looked at, you know, um, if we looked, if we zoomed into, like, the x-axis to, like, one year, we probably would see a dip when Katrina yeah. happened. And then it probably would bounce back, but but it's not kind of the the uh, decade scale thing we're looking at here. Yes, emission standards. Um, so certainly some of that did happen. Kind of if we look in particular at the early Obama era, um, there were there were tighter emission standards on things like vehicle emissions. Yep, that that's certainly part of it. Yes, globalization. Globalization. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of offshoring, basically of of manufacturing. So um, some of that predated the the two thousand five uh, era, but but yeah, a lot of factories and things like that moved overseas, and that's part of it. Something else in, in the electricity sector specifically that I'm thinking about, fracking. Yeah, so that that yes, we'll look at we'll drill down by sector here, but that's basically the the main thing that caused this uh, this emission decline. So. Uh, most of the progress, and I don't want to give away the next few slides, but most of the progress on decarbonization that we've made so far has come from swapping out coal-fired uh, electricity generation, which coal is is the, the dirtiest in terms of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions, and swapping in uh, natural gas-fired generation, and to a lesser extent, uh, wind power as well. So, um, so gas is about half as polluting in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And in 2005, a new technique for getting gas out of underground reservoirs that we thought uh, you couldn't get gas out of basically um, was developed and that's called hydro fracture or uh, fracking. So the idea is to put fluids underground and uh, you know, basically smack them really hard and, and they, uh, the, the pressure of the fluid cracks rocks. And then you pull the fluid back out and you get with it a bunch of, uh, of gas essentially. Um, so that basically caused a, a boom in natural gas fire generation that displaced a lot of coal, and that's more or less what's caused this decline. So maybe I can convince you of that by looking at, at what's happened in other sectors. So this is the same plot, different y-axis, but we're looking at the transportation sector, specifically, so planes, trains, cars, automobiles, and, and so forth. Um, so here there's a little bit of a decline, about negative uh, nine megatons per year. But again, to get on track with this 80% reduction, we need about a 12x acceleration in the transportation sector rather than a 5x acceleration that we saw overall. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the building sector. So you can see that um, basically from, from things like heating and cooling buildings, providing hot water, cooking, the other stuff that we do in our homes and businesses, uh, this has been getting worse over time. Um, and this does not include the electricity that's used in buildings. So that's broken out um, typically in these reports into a separate sector, the electricity sector. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. Um, so buildings use most of the electricity, about 75% of the electricity that's produced in the US. Um, so the electricity uh, has been getting cleaner. And so in that sense, the building sector has been getting a little bit better. Um, but in this graph, we, we separate that out. Does yes. Include, like, industrial, um, uh, this includes residential and commercial buildings. So it's not, it's not manufacturing, it's not oil refining, stuff like that. It's basically businesses and, and homes. Yeah, good question. Okay, so um, so not only in the building sector do we, do we need to uh, basically turn this trend around um, from increasing by three megatons per year to decreasing, but then after flipping that, we also need to speed up by a factor of 17. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll talk about this in more detail, but basically the way that I think we should do that is by swapping out the fossil fuel stuff that we used for, uh, you know, for cooking, for heating water, for heating space, and replace it with electric stuff. And uh, the reason there is that the real success story of U.S. decarbonization over the last, you know, basically my lifetime uh, has been in the, uh, the electricity sector. So here we see very sharply that, that peak in 2005. And again, this is basically the boom of natural gas. 
And since then, we've been on a decline of about uh, 61 megatons per year. So that's roughly two thirds of the overall emission decline that we've seen in the US is coming from the power sector. And so, you know, we still need to speed up a little bit in the electricity sector, but we're already on the right trajectory. And so that's really a, a key factor when we think about how to decarbonize in the US is to recognize that the real big success we've had is in the power grid. And so in some sense, now our job is to use that clean electricity to provide other services um, like heating, driving, et cetera. So I want to illustrate that strategy. Um, so on the left, uh, uh, sorry, the y-axis here, I'm again plotting uh, US greenhouse gas emissions. And this is just uh, 2021 emissions, which is the most recent year that I could find from the EPA. And so the total is about 6,000 megatons um, per year. And we've broken it out into, into these sec sectors here. So, um, so I'll illustrate this basic two-step two strategy that, um, that US policy and, and uh, decision makers are really pushing at this point. Um, so the first is to try to decarbonize the grid. And again, this is not an easy thing to do, but it's something that we are good at, right? We've been doing it for about 10 years and, and we, by all signs, will continue doing it. So this is deploying things like nuclear, hydropower, wind power, solar power, et cetera. Um, and that gets us to about a 25% reduction if we just do that. Um, and then step two is to use that clean electricity to provide services that are normally provided today by uh, fossil fuels. So the first uh, step there is to look at basically private vehicles, things like um, SUVs, pickup trucks, you know, cars, et cetera, and to switch those over. So this is if we flipped a magic switch and, and we made all the vehicles that people drive in, in the US, um, not heavy duty trucking, not planes and boats and stuff, but, but all the private vehicles, if we made those all electric. So that would give us about another 16% reduction from 25 up to 41. And then um, in addition to driving, if we also could electrify heating uh, for our businesses, our homes, and for some industrial processes uh, that use you know, basically hot water or other hot fluids in order to do chemical reactions and things like that, um, then we could achieve about another 20% reduction, bringing the total up to somewhere between half and, and two thirds. So this two-step strategy, clean up the grid and electrify everything that we can, uh, it doesn't get us all the way, right? 60% is not the 80% that we're looking for, um, but it gets a big portion of, uh, of that done. And uh, so what's left over here, um, so in the transportation sector, this is um, rail, which also we could electrify, but I didn't include that in this graph. It's, uh, it's planes, which is about 3% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the US less than some people think, but still a significant chunk. And those are, are very tough to electrify because of course weight matters a lot when you're talking about flying around. Um, and then also in here is, is um, long distance shipping. So long haul trucking is a tough thing for uh, electrification. You know, if you have to charge every 300 miles, a, a trucker is gonna get pretty bored um, and, and uh, slow down a lot. So there's a lot of work to be done still to decarbonize the transportation sector and in the industrial sector here. So this includes, um, really high temperature chemical processing and other industrial processing. Um, so that's a lot harder to do with electricity in an efficient and, and cost-effective manner. Um, it also includes a lot of things that just directly emit greenhouse gases. So making cement, for example, um, basically the way that we make Portland cement today, which is what most of the buildings here on campus are, are built out of primarily, um, it, it just emits a lot of uh, carbon dioxide directly from the chemical process. So it's stuff like that. And then in the building sector, I have not included um, basically cooking. That's essentially what this wedge is here. And of course, we haven't touched agriculture at all. So emissions from our food systems um, are, are sort of a different topic, not something that we're going to talk about much in this class, but also certainly important. Okay, and by the way, guys, if you have questions and folks online, if you have questions, please um, just speak up. Okay, so that's kind of the emission strategy. Um, you know, it's kind of the problem and one way to solve it, not necessarily the best way, but certainly an effective way based on technologies that we have today, we understand well. Um, so maybe that, you know, is not interesting or, or motivating for you. Maybe uh, sort of the business side and the job side is more interesting for you. Um, so if that's the case, maybe I can convince you that um, the DERs that we're gonna study in this class make up a pretty important and growing, uh, quickly growing uh, component of the economy. So um, here, this is a plot going back to 2000 of uh, the new electrical capacity, um, so generating capacity that was installed, um, and it's color coded here. So on the bottom here is coal in, in the dark, the black, and very little of that. It's really only in this kind of 2005 to 2012 era that a little bit of coal was still being built. And in the last 10 years, essentially no coal has been added to the US grid. And then the next here, the dark gray is, um, is natural gas or, or methane. 
And again, you can see that in this kind of 2000 to 2010 era, a whole lot of gas was added to the grid. And then green uh, is, is wind. So again, in that actually similar time frame, 2005 to 2015-ish, there was really explosive growth in the wind sector, um, which is now pretty close to a mature um, economic sector, right? There, there's been a lot of growth here in the US and, and also abroad. And then solar really didn't start its takeoff. So that's the next wedge, the kind of orange one, uh, until about 2013, 2014. Um, but in recent years, again, due to those um, uh, exponential cost decays that we saw, um, solar has become increasingly popular and actually makes up uh, basically the majority, about half of new electricity generation capacity uh, in the U.S. And then batteries, again, you saw none of them essentially before about 20, 2020, um, but last year they, they made up about, I don't know, 15 percent, something like that, of, of all capacity that was added on the grid. And a lot of that is in California, but other states are moving in that direction, too. Um, so here we're showing uh, electric vehicle sales um, going back to 2014. Um, so I'm not showing gas-fired things. This is basically a, a percentage of the total vehicle sales in the U.S. Um, so plug-in hybrids are around 2%, all electric. So this is Teslas and Ford F-150 Lightnings and uh, you know lots of imported uh, electric vehicles are around 7%. And then hybrids, um, you know things like uh, the Chevy Volt. That I, that I drive sometimes. Um, it's 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 not a cool car, but it is a cheap car to drive. Uh, um, anyway, those make up about an, another seven percent. So overall, I don't know we're at 15, 16 percent, something like that, of new sales. Um, but federal policy passed in the last couple of years has put really big incentives uh, toward ma both manufacturing and also purchasing uh, electric vehicles. So I expect this trend uh, to continue and, and in fact to accelerate. And, uh, and then on the heating side, the, the space heating side, um, heat pumps have outpassed gas, uh, outpaced gas furnaces as, uh, and, and are now the uh, most popular um, new technology installed for, uh, for heating in, in buildings. So this is about 4 million units per year uh, are being sold of heat pumps and slightly less than that um, for gas furnaces. Now this may change as well, but, but again, in, in the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and also in a lot of state and local policy, you can find incentives and rebates and tax breaks and things like that for uh, installing these heat pumps. If, yeah, sure. If heat pump sales are increasing um, and gas burner sales are also increasing but a little bit less, yeah. then how come on uh, one of the slides, the building sector had an increase in carbon emissions? Like, is that just because in other other buildings, like commercial buildings, are using more furnaces? Or, like, I don't know. I'm just trying to like piece together why they're. Yeah, so let me actually repeat that for the folks who are on Zoom. Um, and sorry, guys online, I I don't think I did that for a couple of the other questions in the room. Um, but so, and correct me if I'm wrong. Your question is basically: so, if heat pump sales are increasing, but also gas furnace sales are increasing at roughly the same rate. Why are we seeing an overall increase in emissions from the building sector? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. So I think part of this is um, is just adding floor space, like that. So this is the gross. It's not normalized by square footage or anything like that. So you know, even if we keep all buildings at the same efficiency, if we just build a bunch more buildings, um, then this thing would go up. I think oh. That's part of it. Um, yeah, and then. Um, a heat pump is only sort of as good at decarbonizing as as the grid is, you know, at being clean, I guess. Um, so there's really you kind of need them to move forward uh, hand in hand in order to get the big benefits. And so going back ten years, the grid was not as clean as it is today, and so the emission reductions maybe aren't as large. Yes, another question or comment. I mean, we also see some yeah, that's actually a really interesting point. So for folks online, the, the comment was that we see maybe a positive feedback loop of air conditioning use. Um, so this is a subtle point, but um, a, a heat pump typically, at least the ones that are typically bought in the United States, can not only do heating, but also cooling. And so sometimes people put in a heat pump to replace a furnace where they didn't already have an air conditioner. And then they begin using the, the two-way heat pump slash air conditioner. They begin using that for cooling in the summer as well. And uh, and and that causes more electricity use and more emissions. Yep. So that's a very good point too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Overall, like if I look at this graph here, I just I basically see noise. Like th there's not a lot of signal here. I guess the way that I that I sort of cherry pick the data, it looks like there's a slight increase, but more or less, you know, over the last thirty years, the building sector essentially hasn't changed aside from using cleaner electricity. A lot of factors. Compounding. There's a lot of factors compounding. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But good. Good question. Thanks. Yes. 
would be productive to study this per capita. So if like you said, like the numbers are increasing per itself, like family and everything, so yeah, so the question is, would it be productive or interesting to study this per capita? So rather than looking at the gross, could be normalized by something, the number of people or the square footage of building space or dollars of GDP, something like that, right? And, and people absolutely do that. And, uh, and, and it can be interesting. It certainly can highlight interesting trends. Um, so for example, uh, the way that China reports their emissions typically is not gross, which is growing really quickly, but it's per capita, which is actually shrinking really quickly. <laughs> Right, because <laughs> of population growth and, and so forth. Um, so, and in the US, we kind of play games with that as well. So oftentimes people will, will normalize these emission numbers by dollars of GDP. So, you know, emissions are staying roughly constant or de decreasing a little bit in the US, but GDP is steadily increasing. Uh, and so you get an overall intensity, uh, normalized emissions by GDP that, that's dropping really quickly. Um, so yeah, people, uh, in my in my view, play games. So what nature cares about, right? What the climate cares about is the overall emissions. So in my view, that's the the gold standard metric to look at. But certainly, interesting trends can come out of that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So that's kind of, um, in my view, some of the motivation and a little bit of the the flavor of of the stuff that we're going to be studying and and the reasons for it. Um, let's talk a little bit more in in detail about what we will study. And I want to preface this by saying that um, I am making this up as I go along. <laughs> okay, so this is my first time teaching this class, my first time creating a graduate class. Um, I have an, an idea of all the cool skills that I want you guys to have, you know, in four months when we finish this class up. Um, but how we get from here to there is, is not quite clear in my head. Uh, and I'm still, you know, I have rough outlines and, and, and lecture uh, prep and things like that, but there's a lot still to do. So, and some of this I, I want to evolve and grow based on what you guys are interested in as well. Um, so I want to give you a sketch, but but just you know, it's bear in mind that these things could change. Okay, so I want to begin with um, basically learning about modeling and simulation, uh, but specifically as we we're going to apply it to these um, DERs. So um, most of these things are really well modeled using linear differential equations. So um, I know that everybody in this class has already taken uh, ordinary differential equations, probably in your freshman or sophomore year, and uh, maybe it's been a little while since you did that. So we're gonna go back and, and review a little bit, just probably one lecture. And then we'll do an introduction to what are called linear dynamical systems. So these are basically just systems of, of linear differential equations. Although sometimes they have what's called an output or an observation equation layered on top of the dynamics equation. And so there you might have one set of equations, the, the dynamics that describes how a system evolves, the state of a system evolves over time. And then you may have a second set of equations that describes you know, basically how you're measuring stuff in that system, because we don't have access necessarily um, to all of the internal state variables of a system. Um, so this will be basically one more lecture. And then uh, we'll move on basically to, to modeling and, and simulating and building intuition for um, how a bunch of devices work. So this will be batteries. And then again, EVs, which are basically batteries of wheels. Um, we'll talk about buildings and specifically, you know, um, thermal basically evolution of buildings. So um, heating and cooling demand, things like that. We'll talk about heat pumps and, and air conditioners, which are basically just one-way heat pumps. And uh, thermal storage and, and water heaters, which in my mind, a water heater is basically just a thermal storage system that's storing heat in water specifically. And then we'll talk about so solar uh, photovoltaics. And we may layer on some other kind of device, like maybe another bullet point here might be something about power flow uh, in electric power grids. I don't know, we'll see uh, if we have time for that. Uh, then we'll talk about optimization. So once you have the models and you know how to program them in a computer and, and give it input data and see how a system evolves over time, um, you already can do a lot of interesting stuff. Um, but then sort of another layer is to look at how we basically optimize that. So you might say you can control some things that are happening within a system. And uh, like, for example, how hard you're charging a battery or when you charge an electric vehicle, something like that. And so you can optimize those things, uh, assuming that we um, have basically that vocabulary and those tools. So I think the second section is going to focus on that primarily. And we're going to talk about what's called convex optimization, um, which is kind of a subset of the, the whole world of optimization, which roughly speaking um, is kind of the set of optimization problems that are that are tractable, that we can solve efficiently, uh, quickly, reliably, you know, with mature solvers, things like that. Um, and it covers a, a wide range of interesting optimization problems, although not every optimization problem. Um, there are a lot of stuff that, that can't be modeled in this particular convex way. Um, but yes, go ahead. Is that 
the meaning of convex in this sense or it's not the meaning of convex it's the sort of the implication of convex um the meaning of convex it, it's um you know you've heard it in terms of like mirrors and lenses convex lenses convex mirrors um and a convex function is basically something that is is curved up um and a concave function is something that's curved down right and a linear function has no curvature so um you can imagine so optimization broadly speaking is like find the lowest value of a function uh, sometimes optimize over a set or subject to some constraints or something like that. But so um, you can imagine if, if the function is like weird and wiggly and doing all sorts of crazy stuff, that search process of finding the minimum is, is quite difficult. You might have to check a whole bunch of, you know, take the derivative, set it equal to zero and check like a thousand points or something like that. So, so it becomes algorithmically quite difficult. However, if your, um, if your thing is, is concave or, or convex, it has sort of uniform curvature, then you, know, you can kind of look at a derivative and just kind of keep moving in the direction of decrease of the function. And eventually you end up basically at, at the minimum, at the low point. And so that's, you know, it's, it's not too complicated, but there's a whole math and algorithmic kind of apparatus behind solving problems like that. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about convexity in terms of both sets and functions. Um, we'll talk about convex optimization problems, which is basically minimizing a convex function over a convex set. And then um, we'll talk about how to program these things and get real solutions quickly you know, on your laptop for reasonably sized problems. Uh, and we'll do that in, in MATLAB using a toolbox called CVX, which was developed about 10-ish you know, years ago by um, a professor named Stephen Boyd, who uh, is an electrical engineer at, at Stanford uh, and his students. And then, of course, we'll talk about applications. So we'll talk about applications to, to sizing equipment, uh, maybe to, to designing systems of equipment, um, and then maybe to fitting some model parameters, things like that. If you're given some noisy data, observations of a system, how do you figure out you know, how big is the battery or you know, how, how good is the insulation in a house, something like that. Um, Okay, once we have optimization under our belt, we'll talk about control, really optimal control. So um, the difference between optimization and control is really just one of, of dynamics. So in an optimization problem, typically we have some, some static thing, like the, the size of a machine, and we're trying to sort of tune that. Um, but in a control problem, we have a system that's evolving over time. And so we want to dynamically change the way that we're interacting with the system in order to get some good behavior um, over, over a horizon. Um, so we'll talk about a couple of flavors of, of optimal control. It turns out that just like the general optimization problem is, is basically intractable, uh, the general control problem is basically intractable as well, but there are kind of subsets of it, um, specific classes of control problems that we can solve pretty well. Um, okay. So we'll talk about those. Uh, open loop optimal control, basically this is, you know, if you imagine you had perfect predictions of everything that was going to happen uh, in a system, so in a building, maybe what, what the weather was going to do and exactly what the electricity prices were going to be and how many people were going to be inside the building at what time and all that stuff. If you had perfect predictions, you could kind of solve basically a one-shot optimization problem, which would give you um, the optimal way to interact with the building. Um, so this open loop optimal control problem is kind of oriented in that direction. Um, model predictive control is, is very similar, but um, involves kind of recurring optimization. So we do this kind of predict how the future is going to look and make, it, make a plan according to those predictions and then let the system evolve. OK, your predictions are probably not exactly right. So you repeat that process uh, over and over. Um, and then we'll talk about maybe, uh, if time permits, a way to do that in a way that doesn't require models of a system. So this is actually very new. This is a, a, a research topic currently. And then there may be some other kind of control stuff of, of interest. So we might talk about um, reinforcement learning. So has anybody, um, has anybody done or taken a class on reinforcement learning? One, two people, OK. Um, it's, it's not my area of expertise, but it is really interesting, again, in a research sense uh, currently, so we might study that. <coughs> Co-design, has anybody heard that term before? Yeah, a couple uh, iffies. But, um, so co-design basically is um, simultaneously trying to design um, you know, the, the plant or the system that you're working with. So to be concrete, you might say, uh, choose the size of a battery that's going to go into a house. So that's that's one thing that you're choosing. And at the same time, you're also choosing essentially a policy or a strategy for operating the system. So it's when should I be charging, you know, when the price is high or only overnight or something like that. So when you jointly solve those two problems, that's called co-design. And then of course we'll do a bunch of applications that are relative or relevant to DERs. Um, so objectives we might think about is reducing energy costs um, when we have maybe time varying electricity prices. 
uh, low price overnight, high price during the day, something like that. Um, reducing pollution. And again, electricity can be more clean or, or more dirty at different times of day uh, if you have a lot of renewables uh, on the grid. So in California, um, there are times when essentially all of the electricity on a sunny day uh, comes from solar. And so electricity is basically pollution free. Uh, and then there are other times when there's a lot of natural gas being used on the California grid. And so pollution is relatively high. So you can imagine doing a kind of buy low, sell high sort of a thing, but not with respect to a price, with respect to um, how dirty or clean electricity is. And then we may talk about um, basically how to coordinate DERs in order to provide reliability services to the power grid. Um, so the power grid basically operating the power grid boils down to making sure that electricity supply and demand are exactly in balance um, at timescales ranging from fractions of a second all the way up to you know years. And uh, it's a challenging problem. And there are all sorts of services that uh, are, are bought and sold by power grid operators uh, in order to make sure that they can do that sort of dance of, of balancing supply and demand uh, in real time. And, uh, and increasingly, this is a new trend, new-ish, last you know, kind of decade-ish, um, but people on the demand side, um, you know, people like building operators who decide how to heat and cool their buildings um, can provide these reliability services to the power grid, as well as generators and batteries and things like that. Okay, and then there may be some other topics. Again, I'm kind of making this up as I go along, but I, I have a, a feeling that learning just a little bit of machine learning um, might be very valuable. Um, so we probably would talk about supervised learning for those who have already taken an ML type class. Um, and, uh, and we probably would apply it to predicting time series. Um, so you can think of this as just a, you know, a number that's kind of varying over time. Maybe it's the power output of a solar panel, something like that. And uh, so how to predict that. And then um, system identification. So this, I already, I guess, hinted at it a little bit, but this basic problem is um, you have some physical system. So for us, it might be a whole community which has you know, a bunch of heat pumps and electric vehicles and batteries and solar panels and all that stuff. And, uh, and rather than going in and, and looking at every single house you know, and trying to guess what the insulation values are and stuff like that, and uh, going to every vehicle and pulling out the manufacturer specs and saying, how big is the battery and how quickly does it charge and discharge, things like that. Um, so no, rather than doing that kind of first principles modeling process, you can do a data-driven process where you basically wiggle the system around. So you send a bunch of commands to the heat pumps, you know, raise the temperature set point inside. And you send a bunch of commands to the electric vehicles like charge faster or charge slower. And, uh, and, from, and then you gather data. How does the system actually behave? You maybe measure the total power consumption of a neighborhood. And then you can learn some model that relates the inputs, the things you can wiggle around uh, to the outputs, the things that you're measuring that you care about. So um, it, that's a huge field in, in and of itself. And, and none of the stuff we're gonna go into in super, uh, great depth, but it may be interesting and, and valuable to do a little bit of that in this class. Um, we may, and I'm not exactly sure, but we may do maybe one lecture on, on the physics of the power grid. Um, so I know there aren't very many electrical engineers in the class, um, but it might be interesting just kind of at a, maybe at a qualitative level to talk a little bit about um, how that works and, and uh, how power flows. And then I think this one is, is potentially very interesting. It's not really a technical topic, but it is one that's really relevant, especially if you wanna to go to work in a field that involves DERs. Um, so knowing a little bit about uh, how electricity markets work and uh, the policy basically that underlies um, power grid operations. Fascinating topic, not very technical, maybe a lecture or two on that, depending on, on your interest and, and stuff. Okay, so let me pause there and ask if there are any questions either in the room or, or online. Cool, all right, so then um, let's talk a little bit about class policies, and then um, I think we'll have a little bit of time left to just do general Q&A if anything was unclear. Okay, so the prereqs of this class, in my view, it's basically three things. Um, it's differential equations, and actually just linear differential equations. So a lot of what you do in an ODE class, ODE, ordinary differential equations, um, a lot of that involves actually nonlinear differential equations, and, uh, and we don't really need to do that in this class. And also partial differential equations are, are out of scope in this class as well. So, um, so you don't need that. Um, linear algebra, I think is, is actually core to a lot of what we do. Um, it just turns out that like in most engineering fields, if you do stuff algorithmically, whether it's machine learning 
or optimization or control design, um, you end up solving big systems of linear equations a lot and specifying things in, in terms of ve uh, vectors and matrices and so forth. So um, in my view, the, the way that most um, math curricula teach that is not really what engineers need. Um, so I may spend a little bit of time going back over some stuff from linear algebra that in my view is, is helpful, but that you may not already know. And then programming. Um, so there is gonna be a lot of coding in this class. And uh, I kind of was on the fence about what language to use for the examples and, and the homework assignments that I give. And, uh, and creator Sean also and, and I talked a little bit about this. Um, so I actually really like the programming language Julia. Has, has anybody worked in Julia before? Yeah, okay. Um, so Julia, is, it, it's a lot like MATLAB in terms of the syntax, um, but it executes a lot faster because all the variables essentially have types. So, you know, in MATLAB, you just say like X equals 1.37 and MATLAB figures out whether that's a floating point number or an integer or something like that. Whereas in Julia, you have to specify, okay, this is an integer, that is a float, things like that. And, uh, and it just turns out that that leads to really large um, speed ups in, in execution. So Julia sometimes is as easy to program as MATLAB, but as fast to run as something like C. Um, but I don't have a ton of experience in Julia and, and Priya Darshan doesn't either and, and none of you guys do. So it seems like maybe um, not, a, not, not a fair language. So let me just do a, a quick show of hands here. So who is more comfortable programming in MATLAB than in Python? Okay, so in the room that's like six people. And then who is more comfortable programming in, in PatLab, sorry, in Python than in MATLAB, in PatLab than in MyPython? Okay, so uh, Python, Python votes. Okay, so. So it's like 10-ish. So there's a, a modest majority, I think, that points in the direction of Python. And so it's going to be disappointing to you guys that we have chosen MATLAB as the language um, for this class. So, um, and I'm not exactly sure yet, and, and maybe we can discuss this as the semester goes on and you guys get a flavor for like, or a feel for what kind of uh, homework assignments we give and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so uh, so I think for now, my my inclination is to say you can program either in Python or in MATLAB, and we will try to give assignments that are sort of agnostic, right? We'll give you data sets that, like as a CSV, and you know whether you want to import that to, uh, to you know a Julia notebook or um, sorry a, 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 a Python notebook or or to a, a MATLAB script is kind of up to you, um, but the sample code that we give will be in MATLAB and. Um, the feedback, you know, and homework assignments in office hours and stuff like that. I think um, just to keep our TA sane, I think we will only support MATLAB this semester. So I would encourage you to to use MATLAB. But if you're just like, I love Python, okay, um, you can probably probably do that. Now, where the rubber will meet the road with this will be on the um, the midterm exam, which I'll talk about in a sec. But that's a, a take home 24 hour midterm, and I'll have to think through whether we can make that kind of language agnostic or whether we need to pick one. Uh, so I guess stay tuned on that. Um, okay. All right, so those are the, the prereqs. Um, and then a few things uh, might enhance your appreciation. Um, so I know some people may already have taken these things, some people haven't, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you've taken a class in probability and statistics, um, we will work with data and, and generating random numbers and stuff like that. So um, it might be valuable. Also, just uh, everything in the world is sort of data science these days. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you're planning on being in the job market in a year or two from now, I think taking a class in probability and statistics is advisable for basically anyone. Um, machine learning, if you've taken that, some of the stuff that we'll talk about may may have more uh, meaning for you, but, but if not, that's okay. And then we'll, of course, talk about control and optimization. So if you've seen that stuff before. So like, who, who's taken a class in, in optimal control or, or linear systems, something like that? Okay, one basically two people. Okay, um, so yeah, that, that's that's perfectly fine. We'll approach that stuff from from the the basics. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about grading. Um, homework will be twenty percent of the class grade. Uh, it's not that much, but it's actually pretty important. Um, so I do encourage you to to do it. Um, we'll probably give around eight problem sets, maybe six to eight, somewhere in that range. You might think of it as roughly one problem set per kind of class of DER that we're going to talk about, um, with maybe one kind of on some some more basic mathematical uh, stuff. And they'll have a mix of kind of pencil and paper math and then writing code. And I think the focus will be more on the code, because I really want you guys to be able to build out essentially a, a library of functions that you write yourself, um, each of which can you know simulate one interesting DER. 
Uh, and so the midterm might do something like say, okay, here is the set of the ERs that you're going to play with. It's going to be an electric vehicle and a water heater. And, uh, and here's the problem. You're going to want to choose the size of the water heater and the charging strategy for the EV or something like that. And then, uh, you know, and then you'll go to town. So the idea is for the midterm, hopefully you will already have done all the homeworks and built up kind of a library of functions that, that solve all the components of the problem that I give you. So you'll basically just plug together uh, a bunch of different subroutines that you've already written and get uh, solutions to the midterm. That's my hope. Um, Okay, um, so you can do the homework individually. You can work in teams. I encourage you to work in teams. Um, for people online, if, if you want to join a team and, and do homeworks, um, I will help you um, get to know people, either other online folks or, um, or people in, in class. Um, so do let me know if you want help with that. Um, yeah, everyone, uh, although you're working in teams, everybody should submit their own uh, write-up. And it's okay to use outside resources. So for example, if you want to use ChatGPT and say, uh, or Google Bard or something like that, and you want to say, please write code, you just copy and paste the homework assignment that I give you. you just paste it into ChatGPT and see, see what happens. Um, you can totally do that, right? I'm not going to tell you that, that you can't do that. Um, but I do want you to cite your sources. So I'm actually kind of curious. Like I haven't run through all the homeworks that I'm planning to assign. I haven't run them all through ChatGPT to see what happens. Um, but typically I would, I would expect it to get kind of like about a C in this class. So if you're content with that, like maybe that's okay. Maybe you just take ChatGPT and, and you run the homework assignments through it and see what it does. And, and maybe that's fine. Um, but you know, if you want to use Stack Exchange, if you want to talk to friends, all that stuff is, is perfectly um, okay. I just want you to cite your source. Like, you know, we're in an academic environment. So pretend you're writing a, a research paper or something like that, or a project report for your boss in industry. And you want to say, I didn't just make up this number. I didn't just make up this code. It comes from this resource, right? Give people credit basically. Um, and then the homework is going to be front loaded in the first half of the semester. So this might feel a little bit more like an undergrad class in terms of the workload um, for the first half of the semester. So um, I don't know, this depends on how uh, how productive I am in, in creating the homework assignments and solutions and stuff. So uh, this is a little bit aspirational, but we might think of roughly one, one problem set per week um, as we talk about basically roughly one DER per week for the next you know month and a half, two months, something like that. And then the pace of the homework assignments will slow way down. Um, so I may still give you a couple of problem sets in the second half of the semester, but mostly I want your work in the second half to focus on a, a class project. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, so there will be a midterm and it'll be 30% of the grade, uh, a take home midterm taken over a 24 hour period. So basically I will publish the questions and then you will upload your answers, your solutions um, to Gradescope uh, within a day. Right. And everybody will be working on it for the same day. Um, so that'll be taken about, again, halfway through the semester. There'll be kind of this phase transition between learning how to model and optimize the ERs in the first half and then uh, learning about applications and, and other tools in the second half. So the midterm is intended to be kind of a capstone on, on that first half of the semester. And there will be no final. And then the other big component, so it was 20 homework, 30% uh, midterm, and then 50% will be a semester project. And uh, and this, if you want to work individually, you're more than welcome to. If you want to work in a team, I encourage that as well. Um, I'm a little flexible on the team size, but it, it seems like two or three is about right. Um, four might be pushing it. And beyond that, uh, I think is a hard no. Um, so let me say teams of three or, or two are good. Um, if you want to be in a team of four, maybe that's okay, but please come talk to me. Um, and then, so what you'll turn in, your deliverables for the class project, um, basically will be two things. And one is about a 15 minute talk. And um, so let me just preface this by saying the classes that I took in grad school that I thought were the most interesting and valuable, and that really stuck with me the longest, were classes that, that weren't just academic, they were also related to research or a project that I was working on. Um, so I got to, you know, infuse a little bit of my own interests and and, uh, and into stuff that I was learning in the class and, and really do both. And uh, just in terms of your time, like a lot of you are grad students and you're all very busy. Um, so if you can, you know, get a little progress on your thesis research or on a publication at the same time that you're making progress in the class, I think that would be great. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you can give a talk that looks a lot like uh, a technical conference talk that you might give in an engineering conference, an IEEE, ASNE kind of kind of conference. Um, so typically those are kind of in the range of 10 to 15 minutes. Um, 
I don't want to do the classic thing in undergrad projects where you have a team of like seven people and each person stands up and talks for 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, I, I just do not think that that is valuable. So um, I want each team to nominate basically one presenter. and uh, But I don't want that person to be like, oh, okay, this is my job and you guys write the report. I want you guys to work together on the presentation. So you should help with preparing slides. You should help with practicing the talk, right? So imagine that you have a friend or a group mate or something like that who's going off to a conference and you really wish them well and you want them to you know, win a best paper award and, and, and have great networking opportunities, right? So that's the level that you should be helping people prepare for this. Um, and then, so we'll do these in class and in the last couple of weeks of, of, uh, of class, we'll dedicate basically our in-class time to having kind of our own mini conference. And so you guys will give talks and then I will ask questions and the class will ask questions. And in that Q&A portion, basically everybody from the team um, can contribute, right? So, um, so it doesn't just have to be the presenter who's on, kind of on the hook for all the Q&A. Um, and then, uh, in addition to the conference style talk, I want you guys to write a conference style paper. And I don't want a huge sprawling report, right? I want sort of a tight, uh, well-written, uh, concise report. So six pages is a maximum. And if you can get the point across in four pages, that's beautiful, right? That's even better. Um, so don't think of this as, as a huge commitment of like, you know, barfing a bunch of words on paper or getting chat GPT to produce a bunch of copy for you, right? That's, that's not the point. Um, we'll give you a format for the conference paper, but the basic idea is to show um, A, that you kind of understand the problem and what other people have done on the problem. Um, B, what you have done that is new, different, interesting, cool. Uh, and then C, a little bit about how you did what you did. And then D, basically description of results and, and why they matter. Um, so again, I'll give you kind of a template for that. Um, but that's basically what, you know, it, so who has submitted a, a conference or a journal paper before? Okay, so for folks online, that's like roughly 10, 12 people, so about half the in-person class. Um, so this is basically what you need to do when you're when you're writing a paper, right? Um, and for those of, of you who are uh, kind of on a professional track, not an academic track, that's totally cool. Um, you probably will find in your jobs eventually that you're writing reports, um, either internally um, or maybe externally as you know part of a, a sales pitch or product design, something like that. Um, patent applications as well have a very similar format um, to, to academic papers. So hopefully this has value for the, the people on the professional track too. Um, and then this last point basically is getting at, um, I don't know, I think everybody has had this experience probably where you did a project um, with a bunch of people in a group and like one person or two people did the lion's share of the work and uh, a couple people, or maybe one person, did almost nothing, right? So, so that happens, and uh, it's not evil, it's not terrible. Like I've probably been both of those people before um, in projects, so no judgment. But my hope is that you guys really are collaborating and working together and sharing that work kind of fairly and, and equally. So um, in order to hopefully promote that, um, what I plan to do is at the end of the semester um, to have a bunch of meetings with each of the teams. And those will either be in person if your whole team is here, or if you have um, remote team members, it'll be a Zoom meeting, something like that. But um, basically, I'll, I'll want to do a couple things in that meeting. One is kind of a, a postmortem of the class. What did you like? What didn't you like? What do you recommend? Stuff like that. But then also, I want to go around the room, basically, whether it's a Zoom room or an in-person room, and, and ask folks you know, to self-assess their own contributions to the project. So you know, did you do more than average work? kind of average work for your team, or do you feel like you did less than average? And so I will grade, I'm only going to grade the project once, and it'll be graded you know, partly on the presentation and partly on the report. But um, my plan is, or anyway, I reserve the right to adjust individual grades of team members based on that kind of self-assessment. So um, yeah, uh, you're not, you're not going to be grading each other. Um, and I'm not going to try to keep track of what you know each person did on the project. Um, I think that's tough and probably wouldn't really be fair anyway. Um, but I just want kind of an honest self-assessment. And it's okay if you're like, oh, it was a busy semester for me. I did less work than average. Maybe you go from having an A on the project to an A minus on the project, something like that. So it'll just be minor adjustments. Um, Again, I haven't done this before, uh, so if that format sounds terrible or if you have other suggestions of how to promote kind of fair distribution of work within the teams, uh, I'm all ears. But just at a, at, a, at a glance, does that sound fair? Who thinks that sounds okay? All right, so 
for the folks online, that's most of the room. And again, if you have suggestions on these things, you can talk to me. Uh, if you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to Priyad Arshan, our, our TA. You can also email us. That's fine. Um, there are a couple of websites for the class. Uh, actually, there are kind of three, and I've only listed two here. Um, so Brightspace, uh, I think probably everybody automatically enrolled in that already. Um, but if you're not, uh, try to search for our, our Brightspace for ME597 uh, and join it if you haven't already. Um, but basically, you know, here's what the Brightspace looks like. Um, so I'm going to log in. So it's got an announcement. It's got some content. Um, I was thinking I would put everything kind of separately on here, but um, you'll see that actually a lot of it is just links to my website. Um, so I want these materials basically to be open access, not just for you guys here at Purdue, but for also, you know, anyone else who's interested basically. So um, if you click this link, you'll hop over to my uh, website and there's a teaching tab on the website and that's what opens. Um, so if you go here to teaching and then to DER is you get to the homepage for this class. And it has you know, a little class description, it has a flyer and a syllabus and so forth. And then I'm gonna populate this section with slides as we go. Um, so I probably should have said this actually at the beginning in case you guys wanted to take notes on, on the slides. But um, so if you, you, know, you wanna bring in your, your tablet and, and, and mark up slides as we go through lecture, that might be valuable um, once we get into technical content, which we'll start that on Thursday. Um, but yeah, you can open this and then download a PDF and, and that shows everything that I presented today. Right? Okay, um, so that is Brightspace and homework assignments and, and solutions will probably be posted up there. And then the, the midterm as well, we'll probably again, put it up and then send you guys a, a big email blast that says, okay, the timer has started, you have 24 hours. Um, and then grade scope is where you will upload your homework. So um, I think, so I, I synchronized the, um, Brightspace roster to Gradescope, I think yesterday. So if you added the class since then, you might not be in Gradescope, but I'll, I'll do it again. Um, we haven't really populated this yet, but you'll be able to go into assignments and then click on one and then basically upload a, a PDF of your solution. So um, so I encourage you basically, you know, if you're gonna work on a tablet, something like that, you can do a tablet, uh, a PDF, you know, write, write up your mathematical solutions. Um, you can also type up your solutions in LaTeX if you prefer. Um, so by the way, I'm going to require that you do LaTeX for both the, the presentation and the final report. Um, so if you don't already know LaTeX, you will learn this semester. Uh, it's not very hard. And uh, there are tools and all sorts of resources online to learn it. Uh, and you may have group mates who can teach you and stuff like that. But um, it's not a bad idea to, to get, get in the habit of that. Um, LaTeX is basically just a, a language for, for writing up um, nice looking documents. And in particular, when you have a lot of math that you're writing up in a document, uh, it tends to be more convenient and look nicer to do it in LaTeX than to do it in something like Microsoft Word. Um, and there are online collaboration tools. Uh, Overleaf is, is the main one where you can um, you know, jointly edit a document with other people um, in LaTeX. Anyway, so you make a PDF of the mathematical section. Either you create it, you know, type it up in LaTeX, or you write it uh, on your tablet. And then um, you'll upload your code as well. Uh, and so you'll make a big PDF that has uh, figures that get produced from your code and then maybe snapshots of, of your code as well. And then uh, Priyad Arshan will grade and, and your grades will show up uh, for each assignments. Uh, they'll show up in here. I'm not sure I talked about this, but the way that we plan on grading homework, by the way, is, um, is kind of a quick and dirty thing. Um, so again, homework is only 20% of the grade and we're going to grade on a quick sort of three-tier scale. So if you, and it'll be kind of done question by question. So if you don't attempt a question, you get a zero. Uh, if you tried it and you kind of got close, but it's not all there, uh, you get a one. And then um, if you did it and it's correct and complete and readable, <laughs> uh, then you get two, basically. Um, we'll do that for each for each one, and then we'll add it up and, and give an overall score. Okay, and then how to participate online. Um, I mean, we're already doing this, um, but so if you want to, um, you can join the Zoom class and, uh, sorry, the Zoom meeting in real time. It'll always be at this Zoom link and it'll always be at this time on Tuesday and Thursday. And by the way, even if you're in the in-person section, um, you know, if you like have COVID, uh, you don't need to come in person, right? You can join online. Um, so don't feel pressure to, to be here. I, I won't be sad. I'm not gonna take attendance. Um, 
and, but I also recognize that in particular, a lot of the people online are, are also working jobs. And so you may not be able to block off an hour and 15 minutes every Tuesday and Thursday to, to join in real time. So if you would prefer, um, I will record all of the videos and uh, I'll, I'll do my best to sort of make all the content, all the conversation that happens in the room audible and, and recorded on the, on the Zoom videos. So I will put those online. They'll either be um, on Brightspace or I might make a YouTube channel for the class and just put them on there. Um, and then, you know, online section and the in-person section, the work expectations are all the same. Um, so you'll upload the homework and the midterm uh, on the same deadlines, the same schedule as the rest of the class. Um, our office hours um, will all be uh, both in-person and on Zoom. Um, so it'll be the same time uh, and you can join those if you want to, if you want help with homework, et cetera. Um, and then you'll do a project and that'll be, you know, you can do it uh, individually. I think that's very easy. If you want to do it uh, jointly with a team, um, you know, you may join some, some Zoom meetings or something like that uh, with your team periodically. And by the way, people who are online, if you want help forming a team, either with other online folks or um, with people who are in the in-person section, um, I can help with that. And then the only time I'm going to expect you to be here concurrently is at the very end of the class when your team uh, presents their, their final, uh, final report. OK, I said I would save time for Q&A, but uh, I did not. <laughs> so I'll be here for five, 10 minutes after class if people want to want to chat. Um, but otherwise, I will see you guys on Thursday. And we'll do some math. So uh, bring bring your math brains. I don't know. <laughs>